Greetings everybody. Now, obviously the first two videos we dealt with some interesting things. We kind of went back a little bit. We uh, reviewed the um, call to unity um, with Tony Palmer and um, the video that he played in front of the Kenneth Copeland Ministries megachurch and throughout the whole congregation. And uh, we went over that, and then we went over the uh, joint declaration between the Catholics, Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, and uh, the Lutheran denomination. And what we discovered is there was a lot of correlation in the joint declaration between that and the Council of Trent. You had statements come out there saying, oh, well, you know, the church has changed, when in fact that Rome's statements alone says that uh, they uphold to the Council of Trent and that they've never changed any of their canons regarding that. Neither had they revoked or recanted any of their prior doings. So, in a sense, all of the things stand, but what has happened is they put a cloak around it and changed wordings around to make it seem like it's a new thing. You know, and this... Uh, obviously goes way back to Vatican Council II and the ecumenical movement and these types of things, the charismatic Catholic, the charismatic Catholic renewal and all of this kind of stuff. All designed to bring all of the harlot's daughters back to the mother church. Okay. And um, so now we come to some current events and um, and this one is pretty interesting this is from the Catholic Herald and this was published on the 13th of March 2015 and this is uh, titled the headline reads Pope Francis announces extraordinary Jubilee year okay and um, what's interesting enough is uh, a Jubilee year if you look at the uh, Old Testament law, the Torah law, and these types of things, as as um, every 49th year, in the 50th year, there was to be a rest for, you know, the earth was supposed to rest. Okay, it was supposed to be, and also all debts were forgiven, and these types of things. All debts were to be forgiven, these types of things, and it, it, it was a whole jubilee year cycle. And the jubilee year cycle happens every 50 years according to the Torah teachings. Well, here is Pope Francis, who announces an extraordinary jubilee year. <clears throat> now, what's interesting in this, given the fact that Catholic dogma, Rome's dogma, has never changed, okay, their view on Bible believers is the same as it is today, as it was back in the Dark Ages, throughout the Inquisitions and these types of things. So, what we're going to see here is kind of interesting. Why is it interesting? Because not only is this called a Jubilee year, but Pope Francis has specifically titled this year as a year of mercy. Okay, so what happens when this year of mercy ends? Time will only tell. And what I'm going to do is after I read this article, I'm going to go over some other things, and then I'm going to read a portion of of Romanism and the Reformation regarding um, some wit eyewitness accounts of what happened during the Inquisition of some of those that have escaped it and have been able to tell the tale of what they went through and I'm going to tell you right now just like when I did the whole story of 70 AD this is very graphic and detail but I do believe it needs to be known Okay, so just bear that in mind. And what you see what happened in the past, history repeats itself. Okay, so just bear that in mind as we go through this article. Okay, Holy Year of Mercy will begin on December the 8th. Pope Francis has declared an extraordinary Jubilee year for the Church, calling it a Holy Year of Mercy. The year will begin on December the 8th, 2015, which is the 50th 
50th year, 50th anniversary of the end of the Second Vatican Council and will conclude on November 20th, 2016, the Feast of Christ the King. Well, which Christ the King are they talking about? Obviously, it's got to be talking about the Pope because he claims to be King of Kings. He claims to be the Vicar of Christ. Or, you know, Jesus Christ hidden under a veil of flesh. So you have this whole year of mercy that begins on the 50th anniversary of the end of the Second Vatican Council and it will end November 20th, 2016. Okay? The Pope told the faithful at St. Peter's Basilica, Dear brothers and sisters, I have thought about how the church can make clear its mission of being a witness of mercy. It is a journey that starts with a spiritual conversion. For this reason, I have decided to declare an extraordinary jubilee that has the mercy of God at its center. It will be a holy year of mercy. <clears throat> I am convinced that the whole church will be able to find in this jubilee the joy of rediscovering and making fruitful the mercy of God, with which we are called to give consolation to every man and every woman of our time. Francis added, entrusting the holy year to Mary, mother of mercy. Okay, we're going to go into this Mary, mother of mercy real quick as well too. So... Now, think back, the first video I shared, okay, how the Pope was nostalgic and yearning for something. And when you look at the word nostalgic, nostalgic can mean a bittersweet longing for things, persons, or situations of the past. Let me repeat that again. A bittersweet longing for things, persons, or situations of the past. And it's also the condition of being homesick or homesickness. Okay. So what were the situations of the past? And what and the, well, the situations of the past, all you got to do is look at history. Let's go ahead and look at this right here, which is entitled Words of a Beast. Vatican declares its murderous hatred for Bible believers. <clears throat> this is out of Wiley. <clears throat> this is a quote from Wiley. Therefore, the Pope ordered that malicious and abominable sect of malignants, if they refuse to adjure, to be crushed like venomous snakes. Of course, the malignants were those Protestants back in that time. Here's another quote from Wiley. Quote, absolve absolved from all ecclesiastical pains and penalties general in particular it released all who joined the crusade from any oaths they might have taken it legitimatized their title to any property they might have illegally acquired and promised remission of all their sins to such as should kill any heretic or bible believing christian or what they will also label these bible believing christians as is radical fundamentalists as well it annulled all contracts made in favor of Vadwa, ordered their domestics to abandon them forbade all persons to give them any aid whatever and empowered all persons to take possessions of their property end quote there's another quote from western watchman november 21st 1912 catholic website or catholic uh uh it's from a catholic source on August 24, 1527, Roman Catholics in France, by pre-arranged plan under Jesuit influence, bear in mind we have a Jesuit Pope, murdered 70,000 Protestants or Protestants within the space of two months. The Pope rejoiced when he heard the news of the successful outcome. This is from Thompson, the Papacy and the Civil Power. Quote, there was no village of the Vaudois Valleys but had its martyrs. The Waldenses were, were, were burned. They were cast into damp and horrid dungeons. They were smothered in crowds in mountain caverns. Mothers and babes and old men and women together. They were sent out into exile in the winter night, unclothed and unfed, to climb the snowy mountains. They were hurled over the rocks. Their houses and lands were taken from them. Their children were stolen to be indoctrinated with the religion which they abhorred. 
Rapacious individuals were sent among them too, stripped them of their property, to persecute and exterminate them. Thousands of heretics, or Waldenses, old men, women, and children were hung, quartered, broken upon the wheel, or burned alive, and their property confiscated for the benefit of the king and Holy See. <clears throat> Here's another quote from St. Thomas Aquinas. Quote, the greatest of all the ecumenical councils held in the West, previous to Trent, had been Innocent III's Fourth Lateran Council of 1215. In the third canon of that council, it is enacted that bishops should inquire at least once a year in every parish with power, if need be, to compel the whole community on oath to name any heretics whom they knew. I want to pause there for a second, and I want you to think of the 501c3 corporate churches of America. Think about that for one moment. An aider or a better of a heretic is himself ipso facto excommunicate. If discovered and publicly excommunicated, he incurs civil death, and those who communicate with such a better shall themselves be excommunicated. For the heretics th themselves, they are to be exterminated, and, and any prince neglecting to exterminate them is to be deposed by the Pope, who will release his subjects from their allegiance, even if we would otherwise have doubted what extermination means and its final implications, the word is clearly glossed by St. Thomas Aquinas, removed from the world of by death, end quote. That was from Dr. G.G. G. Colton, Anglican Essays. Okay, so, what does nostalgic means? It means a bittersweet longing for things, persons, or situations of the past. The things that has been done is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. History repeats itself. There was persecutions in the past by Rome, and there are going to be persecutions to come in the future by Rome. Okay? And I just want to emphasize strongly that the Vatican will use the civil power to enact these persecutions. Now I want to bring you up to speed here. I want to kind of, t I want to kind of, um, bring you up, bring you back to that video by Pope Francis, and I'm going to quote a portion of what he said here. Two rules: love God above all, and love the other neighbor because he is your brother and sister. I'm going to stop right there for a moment. Yes. The commandments, you know, the two commandments, the two greatest commandments is love God, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength is summarized in the first table of the law that has the four, four commandments that deals with loving God. The second one is our relation to man. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what he said here, because he is your brother and sister, hold on a second. When it talks about loving your neighbor, that is different than your brother. See, when the Bible talks about brother and sister and these types of things, that is talking about your brother and sister in Christ. Your neighbor, your neighbor now, are those secular individuals that don't know Christ that are non-believers, therefore they are your neighbor, we are to love them as we love ourselves. Okay, but Pope Francis here lumps the whole neighbor thing as in they are your brother and sister in Christ. With these two rules, we can go ahead. I am here with my brother, my bishop brother, Tony Palmer. We've been friends for years. He told me about your conference, about your meeting, and it's my pleasure to greet you. I greet a greeting both joyful and nostalgic, yearning. Joyful because it gives me joy that you have come together to worship Jesus Christ, the only Lord, and to pray to the Father and to receive the Holy Spirit. This brings me joy because we can, we can see that God is working all over the world, nostalgic, yearning because 
but it happens as within our suburbs. And the suburbs are families that love each other and families that don't love each other. Families that come together and families who separate themselves. We are kind of, permit me to say, separated. And again, the Bible also declares, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So this separateness that Pope Francis is talking about is biblical. But again, what did Tony Palmer said, say? Okay. Diversity, or our differences, is divine. It's division that's diabolic. Jesus Christ said, I have not come to bring peace on earth, but division. Diabolic means devilish, wicked. So when Tony Palmer is saying these things, he is literally saying that Jesus Christ is diabolical. Jesus Christ of the Bible. Wicked. Devilish. And this is exactly what Pope Francis is also saying. Separated because it's sin that has separated us. All our sins. The misunderstandings throughout history. So the quotes that I read you was just a misunderstanding. It was just propaganda, right? That's all it was? It was just a misunderstanding? So this is Pope Francis addressing via video recording Kenneth Copeland Ministries. I just want to bring you back up to speed of what was said there. So this nostalgic is basically a bittersweet longing for things, persons, or situations of the past. Conditions of being homesick or homesickness. So, what is this year of mercy that will begin on December the 8th? Could this be a hidden word for maybe a warning? After all, you have Pope Francis going to be coming to these shores to uh, address the American people on behalf of a joint session of, comp, uh, of Congress. And he's going to be speaking on the behalf of the American people. He's also going to be speaking on September 27th at the UN for this whole sustainable agenda meeting. You also have his encyclical coming out on June the 18th. That's roughly 11 days from now. When I look at this holy year of mercy, what I see is... This could possibly be... Instead of that word mercy, kind of like a deadline. Meaning if these things don't come to fruition... By November 20th, we will know who these people are that are against us, and therefore we will have to eradicate them. So there is a year of mercy that will be declared on December the 8th, and it will conclude on the 20th of November 2016. This is just how I'm reading into this. Am I reading too much into it? Well, when you look at history, I don't think I'm reading too much into it. I really don't. So I think it's really important that we kind of get this in our minds that things are going to be escalating. And they're going to be escalating very quickly. Because they want to bring their peace agenda out. And they are pursuing this headlong. I also want to bring you to another article here. Pope Francis, religion should not be confined to personal conscience. This is out of Vatican Radio. The orderly development of a civil, pluralistic society requires that the authentic spirit of religion not be confined to personal conscience. We can't have this separateness with religion. We all have to be yoked under and the Antichrist. We all have to be yoked under the Vatican. We all have to be yoked under Rome. But that its significant role in the construction of society is recognized, said Pope Francis, in his remarks to the Italian president. 
Pope Francis, Pope Francis met with Italian President Sergio Mattarella at the Vatican Saturday morning. It was their first meeting since the president's election on the 3rd of February. Quote, the church offers everyone the beauty of the gospel and its message of salvation. And what's that message of salvation according to Rome? Well, you're only saved through the church. I mean, they only use the word church. They won't put Roman Catholic in front of it. But yeah, that's their, that's their gospel and that's their message of salvation. And to carry out its spiritual mission, it needs condition of peace and calm. Pay attention to this, which only public authorities can promote, the Pope said. So he is counting on the public authorities to promote this mission, this spiritual mission. So what does that mean? It means that the beast can only do this with its kings of the earth that are yoked under him. He needs the civil powers to carry out this. So what does this mean? It will be the civil powers that will be carrying out all the persecutions. It's the civil powers that will be carrying out all these messages of peace and these types of things. The papacy needs the civil power to do its bidding. Why? Well, if Satan, who is claiming that he is, wants to be like God... He has to make it seem like that he's omnipresent, doesn't he? So what way of doing that than to have his subjects do his bidding for the chair that he gives its power to? Reflecting on the collaborative relationship between the Holy See and the Italian state, church and state, as defined by the Lateran Pax and the Italian Constitution. On the other hand, public authorities, who are primarily expected to create the conditions for a just and sustainable development so that civil society can develop all its potentialities, can find a valuable and useful support for their action in the commitment and loyal collaboration of the church, he said. Though independent, church and state share, pay attention to this, though independent, church and state the common responsibility they share of meeting people's spiritual and physical needs with humility and dedication. The Pope spoke of the impact of Christianity on Italian culture, including art, architecture, customs, and family life. He emphasized the need to care for the environment and to develop employment opportunities for Italian youth. He also expressed gratitude for Italy's commitment to welcoming numerous migrants who land on the country's shores and urged Italian authorities to petition the European and international communities for greater commitment to assistance in the area of migration. Okay. So we see a lot of things taking shape. We have this Year of Mercy slash Jubilee taking place on December the 8th, 2015. It has nothing to do with debts being forgiven or anything. But what I see here with this Year of Mercy is a year of a deadline. Quite possibly. So what could we possibly see out of this? Well, you're going to more than likely see more of what we saw in Tony Palmer's video with Pope Francis. You're going to see a lot more of that. You're going to see a lot more promotion of falling in line with the papacy. It's going to become more out in the open. The things that people have been saying about the Vatican and these types of things that has been so hidden or, you know, that has been hidden and everything is going to come out into the open. That's what I think is going to happen. And there is a deadline. Who knows what's going to happen November 20th, 2016. One's going to have to wait and find out. But if it is how I think it could be, I'm not trying to set any dates, but... <laughs> it could be a very interesting year, 2016. Especially the latter end of it. And going forward. Now, as I said, history does repeat itself. And so while you're looking at this article
I want you to think about history here for a moment. Because I'm going to read a couple pages from uh, Henry Grant and Guinness's book, Romanism and the Reformation. Okay? And um, this is going to be from Lecture 4, which was John's foreview of Romanism. And uh, I just read you some quotes under Words of the Beast about certain uh, things that has happened between, you know, Albigenses, Waldenses, the Inquisitions, and these types of things. And again, I have to strongly emphasize that history does repeat itself. And if you don't think persecution is coming to these shores, you need to wake yourself up. You need to come out of that slumber. Because it will come here, and you will be forced to make a choice. You're either going to follow Baal, or you're going to follow Jesus Christ. It'll be up to you. But I want you to understand that we are not going to escape persecutions. You're not going to be whisked out of here. What history is revealing here in this book is what we could very well see very similar in the near future so let me get started and again I must say that this is very graphic in detail and I think it is right for it to be graphic so that you may be able to understand what took place then and what is going to take place just prior to the seven last plagues falling and just prior to the Lord Jesus Christ's return. There ain't gonna be no rapture to save you. Bear that in mind. <clears throat> but to come to the darkest feature, has not the Church of Rome drunk most abundantly the precious blood of saints and martyrs? We appeal to facts. What are the Albigenses in the 13th century? What are the Waldenses from the 13th century on to the time of Cromwell and the Commonwealth? You have not forgotten Milton's poem about them, those memorable lines, and what are the persecutions of Protestants in France? Those dreadful persecutions mercilessly continued for more than 300 years. What are the massacre of St. Bartholomew and the, re and the revocation of the Edict of Nantes? What are the fires of Smithfield? What are the terrible Inquisition? Stay, I will take you to the Inquisition. You shall enter its gloomy portals. You shall walk through its dark passages. You shall stand in its infernal torture chamber. You shall hear the cries of some of its wake victims, and you shall listen to their very words. What agonies have been suffered in these somber vaults, unseen by any human eyes save those of fiendish inquisitors? What cries have been uttered in this dismal place which have never reached the open world in which we live? Locked doors shut them in. Stone walls stifled them. No sound escaped, not even that of a faint and distant moan. But now and then a victim found release. One and another have come forth from the torture chamber, pale and trembling, maimed and mutilated, to tell the things they experience when in the hands of the holy inquisitors. We shall call in some of these as witnesses. <clears throat> this book is Limborg's History of the Inquisition. It tells the story of its origin 700 years ago and of its establishment and progress in France, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Poland, Sicily, Sardinia, Germany, Holland, and other parts of the world. It describes its ministers and methods, its vicars, assistants, notaries, judges, and other officials. It describes the power of the inquisitors and their manner of proceeding. It unveils their dread tribunal, opens their blood-stained records, describes their dungeons, the secret tortures they inflicted, the extreme merciless unmitigated tortures, and also the public so-called acts of faith. 
This is what they revealed to the public, that these were acts of faith. Okay. Or burning of heretics. What a record. What a world of tyranny and intolerable anguish compressed into that one word, the Inquisition. And you know, my friends, <laughs> these doctrines regarding the Inquisition has not changed. They remain the same. Bear that in mind. Regardless of what you believe, regardless of Vatican Council II or what the Joint Declaration says, these doctrines and canons regarding the, the, the punishment of heretics, or in today's language would be terrorists, remains the same. Tyranny over the conscience. Men in the name of Jesus Christ stretching and straining, maiming and mangling their fellow men to compel them to call light darkness and darkness light. You see why when they use the term Christian it's given such a bad name? This is why. This is not Christian, folks. Jesus Christ would never condone such things. Jesus Christ would never say go and torture and maim and mutilate anybody. It is Rome that has used the name of Jesus Christ to pursue these tortures and killings and murders of millions upon millions of people. <clears throat> men in the name of Jesus Christ, stretching and straining, maiming and mangling their fellow men to compel them to call light darkness and darkness light, to call the gospel of Christ a lie and the lie of Satan truth. To confess that wrong is right and acknowledge right is wrong. To bow down to man and worship him as God. To call the teachings of Christ heresy and the teachings of Antichrist divine. Tremendous was the power of that dread tribunal. In Spain and Portugal it completely crushed the Reformation. No secrets could be withheld from the inquisitors. Hundreds of persons were often apprehended in one day and in consequence of information resulting from their examinations under torture, thousands more were apprehended. Prisons, convents, even private houses were crowded with victims. The cells of the Inquisition were filled and emptied again and again. Its torture chamber was a hell. The most excruciating engines were employed to dislocate the limbs of even tender women. Thousands were burned at the stake. The gospel was gagged and crushed, and Christ himself and the persons of his members subjected to the anguish of a second Golgotha. Let us look into the chamber of horrors in the Spanish Inquisition. The place of torture, says a Spanish historian quoted by Limborg, page 217, quote, The place of torture in the Spanish Inquisition is generally an underground and very dark room, to which one enters through several, do several doors. There is a tribunal erected in it in which the inquisitor, inspector, and secretary sit. When the candles are lighted and the person to be torched, tortured brought in, the executioner who is waiting for him makes an astonishing and dreadful appearance. He is covered all over with a black linen garment down to his feet and tied close, close to his body. His head and face are all concealed with a long black cowl only two little holes being left in it for him to see through. All this is intended to strike the miserable wretch with greater terror in mind and body when he sees himself going to be tortured by the hands of one who thus looks like the very devil. The degrees of torture are described by Julius Clarus and other writers quoted by Limborg. They were various and included the following. The being threatened to be tortured, being carried to the place of torture, the stripping and binding, yes, all of these people, all of these subjects, all of these prisoners, all of these victims were stripped naked. <clears throat> the being hoisted up on the rack, what they called squ squassation, this was the torture of the pulley. Besides this, there was a the torture of the fire or chafing dish full of burning charcoal applied to the soles of the feet. Then there was the torture of the rack, and of another instrument called by the Spaniards, Escalero. Then that of the pouring water into a bag of linen stuffed down the throat, and that of iron dice 
forced into the feet by screws, and of canes placed crosswise between the fingers, and so compressed as to produce intolerable pain, than the torture of cords drawn tightly round various parts of the body, cutting through the flesh, and of the machine in which the sufferer was fixed head downwards, and lastly the torture of red-hot irons applied to the breasts and sides till they burnt to the bone. Here on page 219 is the account of the stripping of victims, men and women, preparatory to torture. The stripping from them of every vestige of clothing by these holy inquisitors and how they put on them short linen drawers, leaving all the rest of the body naked for the free action of the tormentors. Here on page 221 is the account by Isaac Orobio of what he suffered when in their hands... It was towards the evening, he says, when he was brought to the place of torture in the Inquisition. Bear in mind again, this was a survivor of it. It was a large underground room, arched and the walls covered with black hangings. The candlesticks were fastened to the wall and the whole room enlightened with candles placed in them. At one end of it, there was an enclosed place like a closet where the Inquisitor and Notary sat at the table. So that the place seemed to him as the very mansion of death. Everything appearing so terrible and awful, then the Inquisitor admonished him to confess the truth before his torments began. When he answered that he had told the truth, the Inquisitor gravely protested that since he was so obstinate as to suffer the torture, the Holy Office would be innocent. What exquisite hypocrisy! If he should even expire in his torments, when he had said this, they put a linen garment over his body and drew it so very close on each side as almost squeezed him to death. When he was almost dying, they slackened all at once the sides of the garment and, after he began to breathe again, the sudden alteration put him to the most grievous anguish and pain. When he had overcome this torture, the same admonition was repeated, that he would confess the truth in order to prevent further torment. As he persisted in his denial, they tied his thumbs so very tight with small cords as made the extremities of them greatly swell and caused, and caused the blood to spurt out of, spurt out from under his nails. After this, he was placed with his back against a wall and fixed upon a bench. Into the wall were fastened iron pulleys through which there were ropes drawn and tied around his arms and legs in several places. The executioner, drawing these ropes with great violence, fastened his body with them to the wall, his arms and legs, and especially his fingers and toes, being bound so tightly as to put him to the most exquisite pain, so that it seemed to him just as though he was dis dissolving in flames. After this, a new kind of torture succeeded. There was an instrument like a small ladder, made of two upright pieces of wood, and five cross ones sharpened in front. This the torturer placed over against him, and by a single motion struck it with great violence against both his shins, so that he received upon him, each of them, at once five violent strokes, which put him to such intolerable anguish that he fainted away. After this he came to himself, and they inflicted on him a further torture. The torturer tied ropes about Orobio's wrists, and then put these ropes about his own back, which was covered with leather to prevent his to prevent his uh, hurting himself. Then falling backwards, he drew the ropes with all his might till they cut through Orobio's flesh, even to the very bones. And this torture was repeated twice, the ropes being tied about his arms at the distance of two fingers' breadth from the former wound, and drawn with the same violence, on this the physician and surgeon were sent for out of the neighboring apartment to ask whether the torture could be continued without danger of death, as there was a prospect of his living through it. The torture was then repeated, after which he was bound up in his own clothes and carried back to his prison. Here, opposite to this recital, is a picture representing these various tortures, after prolonged imprisonment, Orobio was released and banished from the kingdom of Seville. 
Before we let fall the curtain upon this awful subject, let us listen for a moment to some of the words of William Lithgow, a Scotsman who suffered the tortures of the Inquisition in the time of James I. After telling of the diabolical treatment he received, which was very similar to that I have just described, he says, Now mine eyes did begin to startle my mouth to foam and froth, and my teeth to chatter like the dobbling of drumsticks. O oh, strange inhuman, inhuman monster man-manglers! And notwithstanding of my shivering lips in this fiery passion, my vehement groaning and blood springing from my arms, my broken sinews, yea, and my depending weight on flesh-cutting cords, yet they struck me on the face with cudgels to abate and cease the thundering noise of my wrestling voice. At last being released from these pinnacles of pain, I was hand-fast set on the floor with this their ceaseless imploration, Confess, confess, confess in time, or thine inevitable torture torments ensue. We're finding nothing from me, but still innocent. Oh, I am innocent. Oh, Jesus, the Lamb of God, have mercy on me and strengthen me with the patience to undergo this barbarous murder. <clears throat> I'm going to stop there. And, uh... And there you have just some eyewitness accounts okay and um, this is what this holy mother church has done they have never repented of it they have never recanted of it their motives remain the same it's only cloaked now you hear about the tortures that ISIS is using on Christians in the Middle East or let's just say Islam which is a creation of the Catholic Church in and of itself and what I just read you is declared a year of mercy folks there is going to be no mercy for those that stand against the Antichrist there is going to be no mercy for those that are against him Eventually, the hammer's going to drop. And this is this period from December the 8th to November 16th. A final act of warning that is being hidden and called a year of mercy. Is this a final plea? Or a, uh, or a numbering of sorts to figure out who is with... Rome and who is not eventually it's going to come to that folks and what are you going to do are you going to be ready because persecution is coming when I don't know but again there is quite possibly this could be what this means Am I saying it for sure? No. But it is your job to be vigilant. And be sober. Because your adversary, the devil, roams around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And how is he going to do that? By getting you to yoke up under the seat of... of him who Satan gave its power because he decided to worship him and he had given him the kingdoms of this world so you see why that I I, I don't give warnings out that much I, I hardly do it because I see all these people who call themselves watchmen. But yet, they call themselves watchmen, but they're watchmen of error. Because they believe lies that have been fed to them and taught them. When I see something like this, 
and I try to look behind the lines, between the lines of this holy year of mercy, what I see is a unholy deadline. And so this is the warning that I bring out. This is the warning that I see. Is it a prophecy? Is it a prediction? No. But it is a warning of how close we are. And how time is running out. Truth be told, truth be known, stay safe. God bless. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Greetings, everybody. Now, obviously, the first two videos, we dealt with some interesting things. We kind of went back a little bit. We uh, So now we come to some current events, and, um, and this one is pretty interesting. This is from the Catholic Herald, and this was published on the 13th of March, 2015. And this is uh, titled, the headline reads, Pope Francis Announces Extraordinary Jubilee Year. Okay. And um, what's interesting enough is uh, a jubilee year, if you look at the uh, Old Testament law, the Torah law, and these types of things, is, is um, every 49th year, in the 50th year, there was to be a rest for, you know, the earth was supposed to rest. Okay, it was supposed to be, and also all debts were forgiven, and these types of things. All debts were to be forgiven, these types of things, and it, it, it was a whole jubilee year cycle. And the jubilee year cycle happens every 50 years, according to the Torah teachings. Well, here is Pope Francis, who announces an extraordinary jubilee year. <clears throat> now, what's interesting in this, given the fact that Catholic dogma, Rome's dogma, has never changed, okay? Their view on Bible believers is the same as it is today as it was back in the Dark Ages throughout the Inquisitions and these types of things. So what we're going to see here is kind of interesting. Why is it interesting? Because not only is this called a reviewed the um, call to unity um, with Tony Palmer, and um, the video that he played in front of the Kenneth Copeland Ministries mega church and throughout the whole congregation, and uh, we went over that, and then we went over the uh, joint declaration between the Catholics, Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, and uh, the Lutheran denomination. And what we discovered is there was a lot of correlation in the joint declaration between that and the Council of Trent. You had statements come out there saying, oh, well, you know, the church has changed. When in the fact that 
Rome's statements alone says that uh, they uphold to the Council of Trent and that they have never changed any of their canons regarding that. Neither have they revoked or recanted any of their prior doings. So, in a sense, all of the things stand, but what has happened is they put a cloak around it and changed wordings around to make it seem like it's a new thing. You know, and this obviously goes way back to Vatican Council II and the ecumenical movement and these types of things, the charismatic Catholic, the charismatic Catholic renewal and all of this kind of stuff. All designed to bring all of the harlot's daughters back to the mother church. Okay. And um it's gotta be talking about the Pope because he claims to be King of Kings, he claims to be the Vicar of Christ. Or, you know, Jesus Christ hidden under a veil of flesh. So you have this whole year of mercy that begins on the 50th anniversary of the end of the Second Vatican Council. And it will end November 20th, 2016. Okay. The Pope told the faithful at St. Peter's Basilica, Dear brothers and sisters, I have thought about how the church can make clear its mission of being a witness of mercy. It is a journey that starts with a spiritual conversion. For this reason I have decided to declare an extraordinary jubilee that has the mercy of God at its center. It will be a holy year of mercy. <clears throat> I am convinced that the whole church will be able to find in this jubilee the joy of rediscovering and making fruitful the mercy of God with which we are called to give consolation to every man and every woman of our time. Francis added, entrusting the holy year to Mary, mother of mercy. Okay, we're going to go into this Mary, mother of mercy real quick as well too. So, now... Think back, the first video I shared, okay, how the Pope was nostalgic and yearning for something, Jubilee year, but Pope Francis has specifically titled this year as a year of mercy, okay, so what happens when this year of mercy ends? Time will only tell. And what I'm going to do is after I read this article, I'm going to go over some other things. And then I'm going to read a portion of Romanism and the Reformation regarding um, some eyewitness accounts of what happened during the Inquisition of some of those that have escaped it and have been able to tell the tale of what they went through. And I'm going to tell you right now, just like when I did the whole story of 70 A.D., this is very graphic in detail, but I do believe it needs to be known. Okay, so just bear that in mind. And what you see what happened in the past, history repeats itself. Okay, so just bear that in mind as we go through this article. Okay, Holy Year of Mercy will begin on December the 8th. Pope Francis has declared an extraordinary jubilee year for the church, calling it a holy year of mercy. The year will begin on December the 8th, 2015, which is the 50th, 50th year, 50th anniversary of the end of the Second Vatican Council and will conclude on November 20th, 2016, the Feast of Christ the King. Well, which Christ the King are they talking about? Obviously.